Okay, so the reaction we're going to discuss now is the iodoform reaction, more generally known as the haliform reaction. So the iodoform reaction. And this reaction isn't really used so much uh, anymore in synthetic chemistry. It's not really that synthetically useful, but what it was used for was as a test for chemical identity. So the iodoform reaction takes place between a methyl ketone, so it doesn't matter what's on one side, or it's not so important, but one side has to be a methyl. And it's done in the presence of hydroxide, so sodium hydroxide will do, and iodine, so molecular iodine, I2. What happens in this reaction? Well, let's take these components and see what the possible outcomes might be. So the first thing you'll notice is that we've put in a ketone, which is enolizable, because it has this methyl group here, in the presence of a moderately strong base, hydroxide. And if you put those two things in together, well then exactly what you'd expect to happen, happens. So proton leaves and we generate an enolate. And that enolate is going to look like this. And we've generated water that can float around in the reaction. The other thing we had was iodine. And we now have a fairly good nucleophile and a reasonably good electrophile in the reaction. So if they are going to react together, to kick out iodide and make a new carbon iodine bond. So if we draw out the product of that reaction, it's going to be down here. So let's draw out everything except what had arrows going from it. So that oxygen is still there. Carbon is still there. Iodine is down here. And the other iodine is over here. We took a pair of electrons from the oxygen created a new carbon-oxygen double bond, took the pair of electrons in the carbon-carbon double bond and made a new bond to the iodine, and we gave these two electrons to the iodide. And of course we have our water. So far so good. So we've done a single substitution and we still have one, two hydrogens on that. Uh, what was a methyl there is now substituted with an iodine. Well, what happens next? Let's think about our situation. This hydrogen was deprotonated by a reasonably strong base, and there's still more base floating around in the reaction. And in the case, usually you would use an excessive base. But even if there was only one equivalent of base, what you have to consider now is that this is probably going to be much more acidic than that, because this also has an electron withdrawing halogen on it. So this would get deprotonated before that molecule would get deprotonated. So let's put in another molecule of our base, our hydroxide. And what happens? Well, exactly the same thing is going to happen again. We're going to form our enolate. And our enolate, which will look like this, except now with an added iodine, will attack another molecule of iodide. And eventually, without drawing out all those steps, what you will end up with is this molecule here. Now, this molecule here doesn't have any protons, so it can no longer be deprotonated, can no longer form an enolate. But this carbonyl is now attached to a carbon with three halogens, three electron withdrawing groups on it. So when it meets a hydroxide, which it inev inevitably will, instead of deprotonating, it will attack and form a tetrahedral intermediate. And our tetrahedral intermediate is going to look something like this. And you've probably heard me say a few times now that you've got to consider reform your carbon oxygen double bond. Can you kick one of the leaving groups out? Well, we're not going to kick out the OR group. We're not even going to worry about it. If we kick out the OH, we're going backwards. And you'll have heard me say quite a few times that you can't generally kick out a carbon with a negative charge. But this is kind of a special case because that carbon has three halogens, three group seven atoms attached to it. So it's actually fairly happy to accept being kicked out with a negative charge. And that's exactly what happens reform your carbon oxygen double bond and kick out carbon triiodide. So if we do that, 
that's going to be more or less irreversible, and you'll see why in a second. We've now made a carboxylic acid and a carbon with a negative charge on it attached to one, two, three iodines. And almost instantaneously, this acidic proton, which is now on a carboxylic acid, will get transferred across onto the carbon triiodide, or the tri um, the triiodo substituted metal here. So if that happens, you can draw in arrows for that if you want. And what you end up with is a carboxylic acid and triiodomethane, otherwise known as iodoform. So you can do the same reaction with chlorine or with bromine and make chloroform or bromoform, which is why it's more generally called the haloform reaction, because you can do it with, well, three of the halogens anyway. Iodoform, as it turns out, is a yellow solid, and if you were doing this in something that sodium hydroxide dissolved in, it's very unlikely that the iodoform would dissolve in that. So this is a very classic test to see, do you have a methyl ketone in your molecule? Because if you have a methyl ketone in your molecule, you'll make a yellow precipitate, iodoform, and if you don't, you won't. At least in most cases. But that's, a, that's the reaction. You can also use it to turn a methyl ketone into a carboxylic acid, but it's not, more, it's not often used for that. It's much more generally, was more generally used as a test to see if there is a methyl ketone in the days before infrared and NMR spectroscopy. All right, that's all for now. I hope that helped. If you have any questions, uh, post them below or ask me in the class or ask me on Moodle. All right, bye.